Well, it's exhilarating because we have so much more potential to reach everybody in the world and in a way that has never been possible before. We're creating the global brain. Everybody in the world connected in a way. But that creates potential problems as well. Um, and I think the, the terrifying part of it is what are we going to do with all of this power? And what will it be like when we in fact can connect with other people halfway around the world in our own living rooms? We're starting to see some of that with the election in, in the US where people are charging fake news and yet there's these issues of, okay, who's actually saying the truth? Um, the internet creates a lot of uncertainty, just as the Gutenberg press must have created uncertainty when printing was first invented. I think really actually being the bridge between Intel and Oracle, which created CRM. So customer relationship management was just a glimmer in the eye of Tom Siebel when I joined him at Oracle. Um, he'd already interviewed 35 people and they had no idea what he was talking about, but he imagined that sales and marketing could be supported by technology. Luckily, I had been doing that at Intel. Andy Grove at Intel had come up with a forecasting method that divided the entire supply to demand chain into about 160 different forecasts. So basically, I just took, it was a big step for humankind, but it was a small step for me. I took Intel stuff that I was doing and I translated into the relational database world. And so I'm proud of it because today um, that small step has created a $30 billion industry. CRM began for me in 1988 and over the next 15 years I saw it become increasingly the tool of the large corporations where management was using technology in fact to manage customers rather than support them. I had created it, uh, imagine that customers and businesses would have a better relationship through CRM. And I, I was appalled to see the, the misuse of the technology. And, and that really taught me that entrenched power will take new tools to further entrench their power. And um, I imagine that, it, that the internet would go through the same um, trajectory as CRM did. It took about 15 years for CRM to be customer centric and we need to make sure that the internet is people-centric because two-thirds, 60% uh, of the world is still not yet connected to the internet. And we should do it, connect them in a way in which their needs, their desires, and their aspirations are for, at the forefront, not the aspirations of large corporations and governments. He and I were a part of the founding team of another organization called Innovation for Jobs. He was increasingly concerned that the internet was being seen as um, uh, a tool that was taking away jobs. So um, he formed that with David Nordfuss coming out of Stanford's innovation journalism um, group. And I was part of that founding team. After a few years, um, we just saw that it's very good to talk about innovation, very good to talk about jobs, but we actually need to do something that's more fundamental and more action-oriented. At that point, um, I suggested to Vint that we do a spin-off called the People-Centered Internet. In fact, I call it the Internet of the People, by the People, and for the People. And Vint shortened it to People-Centered Internet. We are bringing people to the Internet who haven't even been exposed to business or industry. There are young children and women who have not been exposed to the wider world and the internet is bringing the wider world into their living rooms. Um, I'm with the IEEE, the Institute for Electronic and Electrical Engineers. I'm Vice Chair for Internet Inclusion. We work very closely looking at the ethics of the internet and there are severe concerns that in bringing people onto the internet, we are bringing lambs to wolves. We have 20 to 30 years of criminal activity on the internet, becoming very sophisticated about how to take advantage, especially of young children and of um, people who are not sophisticated. And so these are very serious concerns, cybersecurity, um, the fact that businesses don't actually know what to do to keep their records at, for example, the Equifax breach 
has just happened. And people are just like, okay, what can we do? Who's responsible? And in a way, it's happened. It's just like the printing press came and suddenly America happened. <laughs> uh, you can't say, well, who's to blame for America just, you know, becoming a runaway colony? Well, no one was to blame. A whole lot of people just read about things and learned things that they'd never been exposed to before. A lot of consequences come from this widespread access to information and to other people. The project would be successful if we have more people understand the importance of the role of community. We've tried to do things from the top. Top down is the traditional mode. With the internet, we've now seen what's happened when you go from the mob. <laughs> we see community as the sort of balancing force between the top and the mob, and that actually allows us to take runaway personal greed or power and, and balance it out with the needs of other people. In fact, communities have always been humankind's method for ensuring our survival as a species. So for the internet to allow for networks of communities to learn from each other and to take from each other what's appropriate for that community with that culture, that language, and those values, to me is the best opportunity for the internet. I grew up in Singapore. I, am a, I grew up in the British Commonwealth. I saw the impact of colonialism what the internet of the people, by the people, and for the people is to make sure that people have a voice in their future and have a chance to realize their dreams. More and more people are realizing some of the dangers of the internet. We've, we've had a lot of talk about the possibilities, but with artificial intelligence and deep learning, people are really concerned that machines can, might run away with this. Imagine that customer satisfaction survey if there was nobody to talk to, no human, you just had banks of machines. How dreadful would that be? It's kind of a world of 1984. To make the internet great again, we have to put people at the center. We have to put communities able to have a voice as strongly as corporations. In order to do that, we have to have trading posts. If you think about how the American frontier was won, we're now at the internet frontier, and it's vast. We need trading posts where communities can actually work out what's appropriate for them. And so I see the best thing that the people-centered internet can do is actually to have networks of communities improving how they do things for the people who live in them.